way into it. Uh, I, I'm really grateful to be back here among friends. Professor Powell, I mean, is there anybody better in the business school than this guy? Um, this guy right here. I was telling you. <laughs> well, I don't know you, so I can't vouch for that. Um, he's been a good friend of me over the years, um, and I've appreciated him, and I've, I've appreciated what Southern Utah University did for me. Um, I loved my finance education. Years ago, there was a guy here by the name of Derek Snow. I don't know if anybody of you know him. He was teaching marketing here. And he told me one day, we were walking down the halls of the business, the business school, and he told me one day, he said, you know, you're in the wrong degree. And I said, what do you mean? Right? And I really respected his opinion. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, you should be in marketing. I said, well, why should I be in marketing? He says, because you seem like you're a natural fit for it. And I said, that's all the more reason to get a finance degree than isn't it. And he said, okay, you make a good argument. So I stuck with it, and, and I learned some things at this school that I am certain that you can't learn at other universities mostly in the applied science of business and in the interaction that you get with dynamic, intelligent, capable professors. I mean, you just, you're not going to find a better place to hone your education and get a feel for what it's like to be a business person. Uh, finance is, is my, my BS. I've got some slides here, but you're, you're going to see me move around quite a bit. Um, my entrepreneurial path, on the bottom right hand you see a graphic. Those are uh, all different ventures that I'm currently involved with. Um, once I left Southern Utah University, well, I, while I was here at Southern Utah University, I had a, a mentor and friend. I worked at the Centrum, and we would get up, at, we'd start work at 6 o'clock in the morning, and we would go through and check every light bulb in the Centrum. And then the payoff for that was we got to do sound and light engineering for concerts. And all the basketball games, and all of the, we didn't have volleyball back then, but the gymnastics events, and all the other special events that we did, we got to be front and center for all that stuff, and we got to engineer sound and lights and be a part of that. Um, and his wife, she came to me sort of like Derek Snow did, and said, you know, you're really wasting your potential with a finance degree. And I kept start, I started to see a theme. I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on? And she said, there's so much more that you can do. And at that time, Wall Street was my objective. That's all I wanted to do. And I don't know if any of you, anyone know Professor Harris, Steve Harris? He's still teaching? Not here. No, no, not retired. OK. His program was transformational. It was, it was amazing. It was the most exhilarating thing I'd done in my entire life. Having to spend real money for my, for my, my degree and having to win or die, that was exhilarating. It was a thrill of a lifetime for me. But she said, you know, there's a lot more out there for you. So I was working for Fitch Ibka. Um, and I found my, my path into medicine. But before, but before all of that, <coughs> my entrepreneurial career started in 1986. I was eight years old, and I found out that if you mow people's lawns, they give you money. <laughs> and that was pretty exciting, right? And I think I was maybe making five bucks a lawn. And I was probably I was probably getting way underpaid at the time. But five bucks was awesome because it met my objective of being able to walk down the street two blocks from my house and buy donuts on Saturday morning. That was, that was the best thing in the world. That's where my love of the of the chocolate bar donuts came into reality. I see you not here with me. <laughs> Doesn't get any better. I've since transitioned to buttermilk donuts with icing on them. That's that's better. Although I don't eat them much anymore. Um, after that, I, I just began working at a sporting goods store and a motorcycle shop. And I worked really closely with a guy. I bugged him every day for two years to give me a job. And finally one day he said, Kurt, I'll make you a deal. I said, OK, I'm in. Whatever the deal is, I'm in. <laughs> and he said, Saturday, 8 o'clock, you have eight hours. If I like you, I'll keep you. And if I don't, you have to swear to me you'll never ask me for a job again. <laughs> and I said, I'll take the deal. And I worked harder than I'd ever worked before in my life. I left the shop, and I was black from head to toe. And at the end of the day, he became my boss after that. He said, you know, we have rooms for that. <laughs> I'm not sure I did any good in the shop that day. But I was covered head to toe in dirt and grease and oil and gas. It was terrifying. <coughs> but I got to spend two years with a guy who didn't have any education in business. He just had guts. He had guts, he had hearts, he had determination that was unyielding. 
And the guy really was a really good motorcycle rider, so that can pay off for him as well. But I don't know, I learned a lot of great lessons. That's my first apprenticeship in entrepreneurship. Fast forwarding to 2003 to 7, I got to work at a, at a medical practice. Ophthalmic surgery, in case you uh, don't know anything about it, I actually spelled the word wrong in a follow up email on my interview, which was really embarrassing to me. I don't, I don't like making mistakes, and especially when I'm trying to get a job. Okay? And I, I was coming out of college, I was inexperienced, I had no experience in medicine, other than I spent a lot of time in the ER because I was, I was a bit of a reckless kid. And here I spelled the name wrong. He corrects me in the email. And now I'm running a practice. Multi-million dollar budget, multi-specialty, multiple surgeons. I know nothing about the business. And I attacked that business voraciously, and I made a billion mistakes. But I got to learn how to run a big business with someone else's mentoring. And that was a great experience for me. Uh, I was recruited by Advanced Medical Optics, which a short 10 months after I joined them in the middle of the 2008 market crash, basically disintegrated in value. They killed all of us that were in their consulting group, shed the business, sold off to another company, which then got resold and then has been resold again in the last 60 days. But they were the number one laser manufacturer for LASIK eye surgery in the world. Total cowboy stuff. It was phenomenal. It was an exciting time for me. But I learned in, in those moments how to be independent and how to be productive without somebody monitoring you every minute of the day. Which fueled my fire to have my own businesses. When the music stopped on the economy and they shed our division and sold the company, some of the people I'd been working with came to me and said, look, we'll, we'll hire you. Come work with us. We want to keep working with you. Just hang out your own sheet. Do your own thing and we'll hire you. And so I said, great, I have all these people supporting me. And then I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and I was out of my, my severance, and I was out of my savings, and I was wondering, what in the world did I do? And out of nowhere, from a little marketing piece I did, some guy remembered that he met me six months previous. He was my first client. It was a skinny deal. It was a skinny contract. I don't know how I survived. It was in 2008, the worst time to start a business, especially a services-based business, selling intellectual property and ideas, right? But it was an exhilarating time for me. I've never been more exhilarated in my entire life. And that's when uh, Envision Management and Marketing started. Um, I was doing strategic consulting, um, helping people manage their businesses, get their finances in order, and we always got to do marketing, which was the fun part. That's always the payoff in business, by the way. Do your, run your business right, and then you get to do marketing. <laughs> but in that order, in my experience. Since that time, um, I've become a, the majority partner in, in a business called Neon Brand, which is a digital marketing agency. We build websites, and we do social media marketing. We do a lot of cool stuff. We build software applications, which the two on the bottom are actually software applications that we've developed. Software is a solution for businesses, and then Preserver Missions is kind of a cool thing. That's a new application we've developed as well. So the path to entrepreneurship for me went from these, these big ideas and these big organizations to wondering if I was going to be able to put food on the table for my wife and kids and I to now being able to be involved in some really amazing projects that I really love and really enjoy. So they asked me to tell you one thing. Who in the, who in the room knows this reference? Okay, that's what I thought. Me and Andy. Me and Andy. Even, when I was Tyler, putting, even Tyler doesn't know the reference. When I was putting this together, I was like, you know, none of these students are going to have any idea who that guy is. They're gonna, not going to know who Curly is. So, is, is my voice doing okay? Do I need the microphone? Okay, good. I'd prefer to not wear it if I can. So, I don't know how we're going to be on audio-visual here, because we had a little thing getting started, but here we go. Let's see if we can learn from Curly. This is from the movie City Slickers, by the way, which is a classic, which you should probably all watch. All right, should we give it a whirl? Yeah. Let's see what happens. It's hard to live a life under wear a But a dime breaking. Still means something. 
you know, a couple of days, we'll move this herd across the river, right through the valley. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing like bringing in a herd. See, now that's great. Your life makes sense to you. <laughs> What's so funny? You see, you folks, you worry about a lot. I'm just saying. Uh, how old are you? 38. 39. Yeah. You all come up here about the same age, the same problems. You spend about 50 weeks a year getting knots in your rope, and then, then you think two weeks up here about time for you. None of you get it. Do you know what the secret of life is? No, what? This. Your finger? Just one thing. You stick to that and everything else don't mean. That's great, but what's the one thing? That's what you've got to figure out. <laughs> so, great movie, great line. So, <clears throat> I've spent the better part of eight years now trying to figure out what that one thing is. And um, I always go back to Vince Lombardi. Anybody know Vince Lombardi is? Okay, so we know Vince Lombardi. We don't know Jack Palance and Curly, but we know Vince Lombardi, okay? Vince Lombardi, this is an excerpt from one of his quotes. Vince Lombardi said, which I think is the heart of an entrepreneur's life, is that there's something good in men that that appreciates the grind, the hard work of it. And uh, if there's any one constant in all that I've been able to experience in my business career, and my educational career, which is where it all started, is that the persistence, the dogged persistence in many cases, with some quality education is the key to your success. And I'm going to elaborate on that, and we're going to talk about it as a group. Okay. I don't like being talked that. I'm sure you guys don't either. The other thing is, he says, the dictionary is the only place that success comes before hard work. Hard work is the price we must pay for success. <coughs> I have found that to be a universally applied principle in everything I've ever experienced in my life. My successes <coughs> are directly tied to my work ethic and my work ethic. There's another great video from Gino R.E.M. Anybody know who Gino R.E.M. is? <laughs> in this technology world, look up Gino Ariana. You can say Gino Ariana, enthusiastic kids. Okay. If I could make it required for you to, to watch that before you can graduate, then I would do it. Spell that for us, Kurt. Would you? Gino is G E N O. Last name is A U R E M I A. Put it up here. Gino R.E.M. is the head coach of the uh, R.E.M. He's the head coach of the UConn women's basketball team. He'll go down in history as the most successful collegiate basketball coach. No one will have more wins than him ever. Um, anyway, he, he has a little two-minute excerpt that I think is valuable for you as you think about uh, the potential of a career in entrepreneurship. And I think he'll, he'll give you a sense of what successful people are going to be attracted to as you go through the future of your career. So, I love Vince Lombardi. He has lots of great quotes. I love Gino Ariema. So here's a, here's a few thoughts that I thought I might share. Hard, hard work and discipline I don't think there's, there's any substitute for it, but I'm going to expand on that in a minute. But here's a few thoughts for you to think about, as, as I see it for my entrepreneurial career, which I, by the way, I consider just getting started. And um, I hope that you don't take from my being up here that I am a renowned expert on the subject. Because I just feel like I'm getting started. And that's part of the thrill of it for me. But I learned, I learned this, this key principle, a smaller percentage of something is worth far more than a fuller percentage of nothing. 
If we started a list of good ideas in the room for your businesses, we'd probably have 15 or 20. Who has a new business idea that they But they want to they want to expose to the market. Nobody? What are you doing here? All right. Let's get some hands up. Don't be bashful. I, I mean I won't pick on you, I promise. I want to be volunteer. Okay? A smaller percentage of something is worth a fuller percentage of nothing. Sometimes you got to give to get. And if you want me to give fuller detail, you can ask me some questions about a couple of those development projects we've done in your applications to help me understand why I say that. Greed often masquerades itself as wisdom or conservatism. You're going to tell yourself as an entrepreneur, no, I'm just being conservative, I'm being careful, so I don't want to give away a piece of my company or a piece of my idea. False. It's greed. So be careful as you think about introducing your product to market or your idea to market that you don't let your own greed convince you that it's wisdom. Because a lot of times it's not. And I'm telling you this because I have made that mistake. A, a, a couple of times I've made that mistake. And I wish I had because I got behind in the market because I made that mistake. I didn't have the courage to overcome my personal pride and give away a little bit so that I could get a lot. Just remember that. When you have that brilliant idea, remember, a little bit smaller piece of something is way better. You can never do too much research. Anyone have a class from Dr. Kraft? <laughs> Painful, isn't it? Every minute of your life. But it's so beneficial. Right? Why? Uh, he makes you learn in depth and apply it to real life situations and he takes you way farther than any other class. That I've been to in, in that context. Oh. It makes you work for it. My favorite grade ever was a C plus. <coughs> in my life before coming to this school and having Dr. Kraft as my professor, I had never gotten below an A minus in my life. I celebrated I was a poor college kid. I celebrated with a steak dinner and a night out with my wife. Because I got a C plus out of Dr. Kraft's class. And then the next semester, he says, all right, I've got a book here. You're going to have to read it three times if you're going to get a C. This is right after I got the C plus. And I was thinking, man, I can't go through this again, right? And then he held up another book. And he said, I found one that's equally hard for me that I'm going to have to read three times. And I promise you I'll read it during the semester. So I said, I'm in. OK, I'm in. With that, with that kind of commitment, I'm in, right? I got a B plus out of that class. It was my second favorite grade ever. Right? <laughs> but what he taught is right. So if you haven't had a class from him, and I don't know the rest of the professors here now that the, you know, the seats have changed a little bit since I was here, take one from him. Even if you graduate, out of the class from him because it'll make you think better. And what he taught me is there's just, there's just never, I, you can't ask too many questions. When I sit in front of clients now for our work that we do with marketing and consulting, um, it's not uncommon for me to ask an hour and a half to two hours worth of questions. Number one, I'm natively curious. Okay, so some of those questions probably don't need to be asked. But what I found is you cannot do an unresearch. If you want to succeed as an entrepreneur, you have to know yourself and you have to know your market better than anyone else. Does. And I think in that order, you have to know yourself. Okay? You got to know what's going to make you stay up at night. You got to know what you're going to run from. You got to know what you're going to run to. Which buildings that are on fire you're going to run into, and which buildings that are on fire that you're going to stay out. And then you got to know what your competitors are doing in that same regard. And then you got to know what the market's going to do. And this is where Professor Herrick came in for me. He taught us for weeks on end about macroeconomic analysis. And we were all thinking, why in the world are we still on this subject? And then he went to micro. And we spent the same amount of time. But when we pulled the trigger on $25,000 of cash, we, we didn't make a mistake in our portfolio the first time. We had a little hubris because we were doing great and we cost ourselves nine points. But because we thought we were too smart and we quit doing research. You can't do, it, you can't, can't do too much research. Inaction is a decision. Entrepreneurs act. They act and act and act and act. And they fail a lot. But you just fix your failures by acting. 
right? That's the tough part, is being okay with failure. Like, get okay with it. I wish I knew more about Apple's culture. You got to be there. But failure is like an everyday thing for them. They, they, get, they get great things. Google fails a lot of stuff. Failure is okay. You can fix it. Execution is everything. There's a great book, if any of you want to read one of my favorite books written of all time, it's called Execution. It's a strange title, but it's one of the, have you ever read that? Yes. One of the best business books I've ever, I've ever read. Ram, Ram Sharon, I think is the And Larry Bossidy. Bossidy, right. Yep. Ram Sharon is an intellectual mm -hmm. in operations management and business. And finance, actually, Sharp Finance, thank you. And then Larry Bossidy was the CEO of Honeywell. He was a... Um, Protégé of Jack Welch, which ran GE forever. Um, great book. Execution is everything. Once you've done your research and you've come to your decision, you have to execute. You have to go. And that is that's important in any business, but extremely important in small business and entrepreneurship. Because the market doesn't care about you. It doesn't, it doesn't give a rip whether you think you have a good idea or not. You have to prove to the market that you have to go there. And you do that by moving, by acting. The last thing is you can never have too many mentors. Um, I've never been one to actively pursue a big social life. Um, it's never really mattered much to me. But as I look back some 20 years from, so my, my college academic career started in Late 1996, I went on a two-year LDS mission from 97 to 99, so I had that little two-year interruption. But, uh, from, from 96, as I look back on it through 2002, um, I look at a number of people who shaped me. And that's where I want to come back to SU. And this is not just some, I'm not just playing to the crowd here because, I, because I'm at SU, but I'm, I'm telling you this because it will make a difference. I wrote a paper for uh, my econ class when I was a, I was just starting in the business program, okay? John Grossbeck was the professor. So I wrote a paper arguing um, something totally stupid in the track. I mean, I can't remember how dumb it was. And he tore me apart on that paper. I mean, he tore me apart. There was more red on that paper than his shirt, okay? And I argued with him for the next three months in my mind. He was wrong. And 10 years later, I look back and I say, you know, it's a really good thing that he beat me to death on that table because he taught me that I was wrong. And that every class I had at the university was important. My argument was that, economically speaking, general education credits cost people like me time and money. It was a brilliant argument. And he tore it apart. And he was right. All those English classes, the political science classes, all except for chemistry. And I blame Paul all for that. Is Paul is still here? Is no. No, okay. for the love of these days. Okay, I blame her for that. I tried to sneak through without having to take chemistry. But she put me in there as a senior with a whole bunch of sleepy eyed freshmen. And I had to endure chemistry before I could. <laughs> all except for that class. But all those classes, as I look on as I look on my relationship with pe people understanding the market today, if it hadn't been for all of those classes, the toughest classes with Dr. Kraft, the most boring classes with not chemistry, but English, they all went into making me prepare to be an entrepreneur. So along the way you're gonna have a number of mentors. Some of them you're not gonna like. Some of them you're not going to like. They don't care. They just want you to be better. So take it from them and learn from them. My wife, as I was preparing this last night, asked me, what drives you? What is your deal? I think what she really meant was, what is your problem? <laughs> for, years, for years as I was going through this entrepreneurial process and I was trying to make money and feed my family, I've got three kids, and uh, oldest is 14, youngest is nine. Um, she asked me, what drives you? And all through this process, she, she must have said 25 times what she said once. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be better if you just went to have a real job? <laughs> and, and in the middle of working with these clients and busting my butt every day to do good for them, I, I'd respond, well, this feels pretty real to me. 
I mean, 60 hours, 70 hours a week working for these clients, that feels, that feels pretty real to me. Um, but the answer, as, as I thought about her question last night, was I love risk. This year, my goal is to jump out of an airplane. I, I love going fast on motorcycles, although I haven't traded that in either Ryan also had a slower, so it didn't freak my life out. <laughs> traded in my street bike. <clears throat> I love going fast. I love being exhilarated. Risk is probably the top on the list. I love the thrill of the kill. I'm not so much the hunt yet. I love the thrill of the kill. I love, I love when something succeeds. I love achieving a goal. Whatever the goal is, small, large, I just love the thrill of the kill. It, there's, no other, there's no other avenue that allows you to create quiet life entrepreneurship than running your own business and seeing your idea come to life. But I want you to be really careful that you understand that if I hadn't had a great business education, I, I, I couldn't. I, there's no way I could succeed at anything. I look at I look at people who I interact with on a daily basis that don't have a business education or don't have any education, and I watch them struggle to make good business decisions and have their finances in order, and they have all that stuff come together. And, and you know, I think I thank God every day of my life that I had a great business education because if not. I mean, I, I'm certain that my business ventures were there. <coughs> Ability to lead, people are, people can be the best part of your business. When I look back on my business career, the people that I've been able to interact with, that's what I remember the most. That, that's, that's what means the most to me. You could fill a room up with money that I could swim around in, and that doesn't really thrill me, but it actually cash flow. But being able to do something and make a difference, that's a blast. And the last one is freedom. I mean, you go to bed every night with your problems in your business. They're nobody else's. You don't have a boss to pass them off to. You go to bed with them, you wake up with them. But the highs of your, of your entrepreneurial successes are a million times higher than you work for someone else. The lows are inversely low, right? I mean, it, it, the lows are tough, too. But what comes out of that is, a, is, a, is an emotional fortitude that I think is... I don't think you can get that in any, in, in any classroom. And I value that greatly. So I've left some time for some questions. Um, let's talk. What are your thoughts? What questions do you have about entrepreneurship or any, any ideas that you might have that you want to share with the group that maybe we can beat up here? <laughs> so that first, part, first your name. My name is Jack. All right, Jack. Um, that part where you spoke about great offense, great wisdom, and um, another thing that I've heard before is when it comes to you know, equity, it, I, I don't remember where it was, but it's not, um, never give equity for something to just pay someone to do. Um, so how do those two kind of work together? Because uh, I'm in kind of the situation right now where I've got the opportunity to give someone equity, but I worry I think, well, should I just pay them find someone that I can just pay to do the work and then keep it myself, or is it better to get someone? I think I think that the second statement is generally true. I think it's generally true. But but if, if that if instead of paying that person to just get you to the next step, the next stage of the process, which just keeps you kind of in the in the ball game and kind of alive, if that's all it's doing, then I don't believe that statement is accurate. If if that's going to take you to the next level, if that's going to help you tip and in your research, not your gut, okay, because it lies. It wants you to win, right? It wants you to win back. But if your research confirms what your gut is telling you, and do not dismiss your gut in entrepreneurship, because gut's a hard man. It's what makes it work. But if you if you your research tells you this will make me tip, and instead of instead of paying, you know, a ten percent stake in the business that could be worth, I don't know, let's just say half a million down the road, I can spend five thousand now. Bag, borrow, steal, sell your car, and and pay for that service. If it will make you pay. But make sure your research is done. Did you have a question on my my uh, uh, smaller percent of something big is better than? Did you have a question on that? No, it was just kind of related. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 Don't. One thing that I one thing early on that I was afraid of was giving up equity because I was afraid of giving up control. And I kind of have a type A personality, I think control is kind of my thing. 
But, but what, I, what I realized later on as I matured and as I realized my immaturity is I, I missed a window. In, in the one business, in the one software business I see, I missed a really good window of opportunity because I was too greedy with an equity stake. I should have given the equity stake away. I should have raised the capital. I should have spent that money on development and, and rocked it. I made a, a real tactical error on that one. I just, I'm going through that right now. Uh, but just a comment on that. Um, I think it's situational. And in the business that I'm, I have three partners, so there's four of us. In the business we're in right now, we bootstrapped it, bootstrapped it, bootstrapped it. We got a time, we're now at the point where we, we needed money. And we've had people offer us money. But we didn't want to give equity now because to give equity now, it's, it's a big chunk for that money. And we have the means to be able to come up with the money, so we decided that the money we needed was to pay a consultant. He wasn't interested in partnering up with us, and so we decided to, uh, to pay him. So that tipping point, just to, just to nail down exactly what you just said, the reason we said, okay, it's time for us to not take money, but just come up with our own money still, bootstrap this, and move in this direction is because we feel that by doing so, even though we're going into debt for the first time with this particular company, um, it's taking us to that tipping point. And but based off of our research, I'll tell you what it's done. <laughs> but, but once we get to that point, as it was explained to me, that tipping point, even though we're, the company is still not to the point of making money, we are, we're probably four times higher, greater in value because of what we've been able to accomplish. And in this particular situation, we're creating a prototype, a workable, testable, showable, marketable prototype. And, uh, and even though we have the opportunity to give away equity, to still stay debt-free with this particular uh, venture, we decided, no, let's, let's just finance this ourselves. Let's do it. And, uh, and we're hoping, and that wasn't really what you just said, it made me feel better about our decision, so thank you. But it was, that was why we decided that, is because technically this should get us to that tipping point of where we are now. When you go talk equity with somebody, we have a whole lot more to offer on the table than we did before. I think it's your name. Andy. So, Jack, what Andy is saying here is there's, there's, a, there's a little piece that I think everybody needs to understand. Most importantly, he knew the right decision and he executed the right decision because he had a good valuation. He knew what his valuation was. So if you don't know how to calculate your valuation, you need to get help with that. Okay? Whether you've got somebody here that's a senior that's, that's in the finance group or the accounting group, they'll know how to create a valuation, go talk to a professor, get some help from an accountant. You've got to know your valuation, right? Because what he found out was is that the, the amount of equity that we're going to give up is going to cut so deeply into what our long-term profits will be that, it, that it, make, it doesn't make sense to do that. Debt financing, in this case, is a better tool for getting us to get than equity. So it, on, on the one business you saw on pr preserve emission, we, ran, we recently raised a pretty good chunk of change. We only had to give up like 11% of the business. <coughs> and we own 98% of it. And so for us to be in an 87% equity position to have the cash to accelerate our growth was like, yeah, great, we'll do it. If we can get that valuation, we'll take that money any day. And, and we're, you know, and what happens if we create value out of that money, then the valuation actually gets better for us as time goes on. And if we want to go raise another 100 grand or 200 grand or 300 grand to really go for it, then we would be selling off 5% of the company instead of 11% of the company for five times the money because our valuation is richer, right? So you've got to have somebody who can help you figure out your valuation if you don't know how to do it yourself. It's really critical. Could I do this program? The person who mentored me on that was a speaker in this Entrepreneur Speaker Series in the first semester, so. Good. That's awesome. We're getting good advice. Kurt, I was just going to ask you, you said as you've got out there, you've seen kind of people who didn't go through a business education and you saw uh, maybe some holes in their understanding. It, can you think of any examples of, of where you, you, you were dealing with people and you thought, 
Look, you might understand this really well, but there's a whole thing over here you don't get at all. You're, you're kind of you're talking like you get it, but you, there, there's some foundational things that you would have picked up had you got a business degree or a marketing degree or a finance degree, but, but you didn't. Can we think of some examples of how that sure. has handicapped people that you've dealt with? Sure. So in, in a general sense, the more platitudes I hear, the less they actually know. If they sound like, if they sound like that they read out of the textbook that you're getting in, in, in a management course, they either are inexperienced or don't know what they're talking about, generally speaking. So uh, an example of that recently, we had an, an outfit come to us. Um, they're a startup wellness clinic for people who are underinsured or uninsured. And their goal is to go get people in Las Vegas who are either uh, under, you know, underemployed, homeless even, and give them access to some health care that wouldn't otherwise be available. So I get in the room with them the other day, and I started asking them all the questions about the business. What, you know, what, is, your, what is your per patient revenue? I asked them, um, what does it cost you per day to run the clinic? How many, how, many, how many units of production can you get per square foot? Meaning, how many patients per square foot? How many exam lanes? How many exam lanes are you going to need to service your volume? What do you want your volume to be? And these are all questions that became they were just second nature to me because of just doing it for a number of years. But they didn't even they didn't even need they didn't know how to ask. In order to produce X number of dollars, how many widgets do we have to push through? Which all of you in your econ classes have heard widgets a million times, right? How many do we have to get through in order to pay for our square footage and pay for our physical plant? Those are things that you learn in econ, you learn it in management, if you have an operations. Of course, you have that finance. If you're doing anything with Dr. Kraft, you go through that. Your marketing classes. How do we? So, so we know what we need to get. Well, how do we go get the? How do we go get the client? And so, as, as I dug into their business and found out that they were really lacking in business principles, I said, "So, tell me about your educational background." And the one guy was like a philosophy major, and the other guy was the the lady was. She was a clinical, a medical clinical person. So neither one of them was technically qualified for the business job that they had. They had educations, but they didn't have the right kind of education to teach them which questions to ask. And in about an hour's time, we they went back after that session. They went back and said, "We've got homework." And I said, "Yes, you do. Here's your, here's your list of questions. If we're going to succeed together, we got to know this. Because if I'm going to go market your business, I've got to know that you can service your business and operate." Operations management is so valuable, so, so valuable. Uh, that's one example. Another example, um, we had somebody come in the other day and they wanted to do e-commerce. And they're like, well, you just throw up a site, right? <laughs> you put some stuff out there. You have some pictures, right? <laughs> and then we said, well, who's your customer? What do you mean? Who's going to buy your stuff? Business questions. Stuff you learn in your business classes. I'm going to take it as far as saying that's just a common sense question. <laughs> You'd be surprised how, how in short supply that is in business in America. <laughs> Sorry to tell you. So we take it for granted as, as, as um, common sense, but I can tell you in an applied sense, we are in short supply in, in American business. And, and mostly because it comes from rigor, right? The thing you develop in those econometric classes and linear programming classes is rigor. Rigor in your thinking and discipline in your thought process. And, and in a lot of ways, a humility. When you graduate from college, you think you know everything, right? <laughs> I did. I thought I, knew, I, I thought I knew everything I needed to know when I graduated with a finance degree. I'm an ad successor. And then I got into the real world and I realized I was just getting started. Which is another thing that I, I would recommend to you. Read a tough book every month. Read one that challenges you. I'm reading Deep Work right now by Cal Newport. It's a fascinating read. It's basically calling for the demise of my business, of the Neon brand, but I'm getting these principles and we're applying them as opposed to buying them. So read, 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 read. Always find the next good book. With your, uh, no, no. With your consulting business on the marketing team, how are you proving to your customers that what you're doing is adding value? What, I mean, what metrics are you using? Awesome. So that, that's where the development of the software applications came in for me. When I started with Wellness Vision Institute in Las Vegas, 
Um, so this is a real thing. I, I started, and all I knew about that business was how to read a balance sheet, the P&L, and how to, how to work with people. That's all I knew, okay? I knew how to look at the money. So they had recently spent $225,000 in the previous year's quarter before I got there, which I started on January 1 of 2003. And in the previous year's quarter, in the, the final quarter of 2002, they spent $225,000. And I looked at the metrics, and I saw that their volume had not changed a bit. Their surgical volume was unchanged. Their revenues were actually lower. The per unit, they were struggling, right? So I said, what did you spend the money on? Well, a little of this and a little of that, right? And I'm like, well, well, that doesn't work for me. What did you spend it on? And they didn't know. They didn't know. I didn't know anything about this business, so then I'm thinking, what the heck is going on? So I started to develop spreadsheets. I started tying these spreadsheets together and I developed all these algorithms to figure out what was going on in our business. And, and what happened is I, I, I figured out the metrics, which was cost per day, patients per day. I figured out how, how much my surgeon was working per minute. So every time he was in my office making patients wait, I said, that's $100 he just cost me. He finally got out of the room and he figured out he was worth $2,000 now. Right? $2,000 now. So I watched all of those metrics. What our turnover ratio was, what and, and what our days in days in sales outstanding, AR turnover ratio, all of that stuff. But then I developed the sales metrics, capture rate, conversion rate. Um, we had um, dollars per sale, we had cost per lead, we had cost per unit sold, all of those things. And, I, and there wasn't a good application, so I ended up paying someone to develop an application that we now we're marketing to those people. But, there's just not, I love metrics. I mean, I was trained here to be an analyst, so I can't get enough of it. But those are all things, all the things we look at, when your finance and your accounting classes, those things, trust me, those things matter. Even though accounting is painful, I'm sorry to say. I do not love accounting, but, but you gotta know. At least enough to know what, to know what you don't have to be good advice. Did I answer your question? Was that satisfactory? Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. We're good. Who else? First name first. Brandon. Brandon. Your flyer said that you were an expert at search engine optimization. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that for us starting companies wanting to increase that? Uh, so I'm going to give you a short version of a long answer, okay? So I was doing my consulting stuff and I started referring all of my business to this brand called Neon Brand. They build websites to do search engine optimization and social media marketing, all this cool stuff. And over time I just kept sending people to them. And I woke up one day and I was like, this is stupid. Buy them. So I made an offer. And he said, no. He said, yes, first. And he's like, oh, wait a minute, I kind of like my company. So we're partners in that, in that venture. Um, but search engine optimization, what, what really led me to them is I've done a lot of radio buying. I've written radio spots and produced radio and TV ads and done all that stuff. Billboards, newspaper. It's the least accountable marketing resources out there, in, in, my, in my opinion. And I started to see this digital thing emerge. And the metrics started to get so good. On Facebook, it will blow your mind what Facebook knows about it. Literally blow your mind. It will scare you to death, actually, if you pull the cover on that. So with SEO, it sort of evolved in this thing of becoming popular for Google to being popular across a wide array of different resources. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. Um, and just YouTube, Google, just and then and then doing the right things. So SEO is all about having a good website with lots and lots of content, lots and lots of good writing, and, and proper geeky coding stuff that I don't know. I, I don't know the first thing about code. We have a team for that. I, I don't know. But all of that stuff is what goes into search engine optimization, which is what makes you popular. Google is a popularity contest. It's, it's, the, it's, it's a popularity pageant for people who write good content. That answer the, the that's, that's the neon brand thing that we do. That's the fun arm of what we do. It's all the cool marketing stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it's a blast. We do a lot of fun stuff. How are we on top, Jen? Are we going to Know your name again? Brand. Wicked cool mustache. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'm also a, a finance fan. I must uh, do a book on entrepreneurship. So I'm interested in considering uh, post-grad school. I, I love your experience about doing the medical professionals. Um, right now I'm a uh, supervisor uh, doing sort of medical work. Okay. And I, I really like that aspect of business. Um, 
Is there anything that you pursued post SUU that is helpful? Like, I'm tossing around ideas of uh, healthcare administration or just business or pursuing more finance. I don't really know that. I think I think in any of the, <coughs> any of the specializations, uh, econ, finance, accounting, um, law. I think any of those four specialties. I think they're more in demand and will be more in demand in medicine than any of the general ones in the coming years, just because it's becoming so complex and so complicated. Um, healthcare administration wasn't for me. It was a little too narrow. It was a little too focused for me. I thought about it. Uh, about a year into working at Wellesley Business Institute, I, I considered it because I felt like there were some things I was missing. And when I looked in the curriculum, it just felt like to me it was a little too narrow. Yeah, too specific. And I wanted to, I wanted to have a broader view of the business environment. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we live in medical firms and hospitals. Big programs that deal with such what kind of things you know. Yeah, an MBA, an, an MBA or a MAC will never serve you wrong in the healthcare world. And, and that, that depends, and that works if you want to work for a civil practitioner or a hospital. So those, I, I would say your path towards finance and accounting would, would serve you better in terms of having a more successful career at the executive level in healthcare administration than particularly, and not that they're bad programs, but for me it was just a little bit too narrow for what I wanted to do. Maybe some advice as we graduate, trying to tell ourselves things to look for in business, um, things that we look for in even more. Okay, so do you want to work for yourself or for someone else? Uh, probably a little bit of both. Start out working with somebody else, kind of learn some mistakes. <laughs> it was a good path for me. And, and along the way, though, I, I feel like I benefited my employers. I don't feel like I was along for a free cash run. Okay, I mean, my their 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 lessons that they paid for for me were expensive early on, but I feel like they were. Really <coughs> um, develop a habit of outworking your competitors, both mentally and physically. The biggest challenge I face with today's workforce is there's a false sense of reality because of what technology has given us. And I'm not going to beat up on millennials. It's not my thing. Okay? It's a challenge. It's a challenge working with millennials. Okay, I'm, I'm, going, to be, I'm going to be straight with you on that. It's not easy. Because y'all y'all have words that don't even, they're not even words. Like, what is dope and what? And, like, my, so it's the funniest thing. I have, a, I have a set of flashcards. It's this, it's this the, it's a stack of flashcards. They're slang millennial flashcards that my employees give me so I can understand what they're saying. It's a real thing. It's hilarious. I mean, I have to learn what baller status is and rolling deep and all this crazy stuff. Like, I don't know. Um, but if you can be 50 to 20% harder working mentally and physically, you will never have a hard time finding a job. Because your cohort has not been trained physically. We, we, we're, we're a very industrial, very knowledge work economy now, whereas two generations ago it was very physical, right? So think, so there's, I'm, I'm kind of caught in the middle of those two generations. And so there's, my upbringing was very hard working, grinding it out kind of stuff. And yet my career is knowledge work. And so it's an interesting thing for me. But just work a little bit harder mentally and set yourself apart mentally. Remember, people are buying the person. Okay, they're not buying your textbook or your, or your GPA. They're buying the person. So be better and be different. And, and you'll have any job you want.